uh, had the honor of being requested to moderate uh, this uh, panel, which is going to be uh, focusing in recycling and offshore assets. It's a uh, part of the uh, GMS uh, webinar series, and we are going to try to uh, understand and discuss the challenges and uh, leadership in sustainable, sustainable recycling. Uh, I have uh, with me an esteemed uh, panel uh, with me here, and uh, I would like to thank all of them for taking the time to join us uh, to have uh, this discussion. Uh, I have, first of all, Mr. David John Hill. He's the Managing Director of uh, Brit Oil Offshore Services. Uh, he's the owner and founder, and uh, uh, he's uh, involved in the offshore oil and gas projects worldwide uh, for the past 30 years. Uh, David has been a master mariner for over 30 years, most of which uh, have been uh, especially involved in uh, the offshore industry. And uh, he established Brit Oil Offshore Services in 1988. Uh, Brit, Oil, Brit Oil has been operating mainly anchor handling and towing tags throughout the world, including the North Sea, Australia, Sakhalin, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, as well as many other places, and uh, has managed to build up an excellent reputation throughout the industry. Uh, moreover, I have with me Mr. Ruben Segal. He's the Group Chief Operating Officer of uh, Aqualis Bremer. He has over 20 years of experience in the offshore and shipping sectors, covering both engineering design and uh, ship surveying. Uh, Ruben is a naval architect. He has extensive uh, um, uh, recent global business development experience with a focus on design and construction of offshore uh, oil and gas assets. Uh, David has been instrumental in developing safe transportation and delivering practices of assets for recycling over the past 25 years. Uh, going uh, ahead uh, to the United States, we have Captain Yogi Zuhani. Uh, he is the operations manager of GMS. He has a seagoing experience of nearly 20 years and another 20 years almost in the ship recycling sector. Captain Rohan is responsible for handling the marine operations of all vessels handled by GMS. And uh, during all these years uh, with GMS, Captain Rohan has spearheaded several ships of uh, ship recycling industry with, with GMS from the first assist towards of uh, semi-submersible when no other cast bar had undertaken such projects to one, on, on the one hand to delivering the first jack up into Bangladesh to the other hand. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Anand Harmath. He's the head uh, research and development. Uh, he's the lead coordinator of the responsible ship recycling program of GMS. He's based in India. He's a civil engineer and holds a master's degree in environmental engineering. He's also holding a doctor degree with uh, specific research on ship recycling from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, while he's holding a diploma on uh, industrial safety, and he's qualified the uh, lead auditor of ISO 9000, uh, 14000, and OHSS 18000. He's an uh, approved hazmat expert with DNBGO. Uh, he has supervised excess of 60 vessels for uh, to be recycled in a safe manner while being involved in the preparations of more than 40 IHM so far. While he has been the author in the Green Handbook which is a practical checklist to monitor the safe and environmental sound ship recycling, which highlights the procedures that GMS Responsible Ship Recycling Program is following. Last but not least, I have with me uh, Mr. Fedon Panagiotopoulos. He's based out of the United Arab Emirates. He's a senior trader, a naval architecture and marine engineer, uh, while he's a graduate of the Cast Business School in London. Uh, he joined GMS in 2017, and uh, he's uh, specializing in the sale and purchase, uh, and the recycling projects in particular, and offshore assets acquisition and marine spread operations. So uh, we're here to discuss, uh, as I mentioned already, the, uh, to focus on the recycling of offshore assets. And in particular, we're gonna try to identify through this discussion, uh, the residual value uh, of the assets, how we establish uh, the value of uh, its assets, uh, how is, easy or difficult it is comparing to a normal ship, uh, we're going to try to explore uh, what are the challenges that uh, we have to keep in mind from operational perspective, from a towards perspective and transportation to the final destination, but of course also during a safe and sound uh, recycling process. Uh, so Fedon, I would like to start with you and uh, I would like you to uh, tell us what is your experience uh, in the offshore industry so far? I mean, we see uh, a, a big inflow of tonnage, especially during the past uh, five years, uh, we have seen a tremendous supply of tonnage coming from the oil and gas industry, which I guess uh, can be attributed to the oil prices and the fluctuations that they have been having over the years. 
Can you tell us where are the units coming from, where they're heading to, what types of uh, assets do you see, and uh, how, what are the value of these assets? assets? Uh, I would like to start the discussion with you because once a unit is being placed into the market for sale, you will be the first person to start working on it and then start working with your colleagues on the operational department, on the transportation front, and so on. So, pleased to hear uh, what do you think on this. Thank you, Vangeli, for the kind introduction, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining our third GMS webinar. I would like to second what Vangelis has already said. Indeed, we have experienced a huge inflow of offshore units uh, for recycling, especially in the past five years, uh, and uh, especially the past two years, three years, since 2018, I would say. But uh, is this indeed something new? I don't believe so, because we have done our first share of uh, buying and selling offshore units in the past. And uh, when I'm referring to offshore units, and I'm talking about tags, FPSOs, cable layers, support vessels, and of course, drilling rigs. And I refer specifically to jack-up rigs, semi-submersible rigs, and drill ships. But indeed, there is an increased volume of rigs for recycling has not been experienced in the past. So I would like to start uh, the discussion by explaining what are the types of offshore uh, rig deals that we are uh, encountered and we are encountering currently. And I would like to reply on two points. First of all, what are the assets that we are seeing coming for recycling? And second, of course, being what are the requirements of the owners with regards to the recycling process. Starting from the assets and especially on the drilling rigs, what we have experienced the past uh, couple of years are first of all the jack-up rigs. These are mainly on average five to 10,000 LDT uh, units. Of course, you can have some smaller ones, some bigger ones. Uh, we have uh, encountered units that are mainly built in the 70s and the 80s and built in Japan, Singapore and USA. Of course, we have seen the semi-subs, which are the Leviathans in terms of dimensions. These are units that are averaging uh, 15 to 25,000 LDT. Of course, again, you can see smaller units as well as huge units. And we have identified two different sectors of semi-subs with regards to the age profile. We have uh, identified 80s built units and uh, also very modern ones, 2000 built units uh, built in Singapore. Of course, some of them have been visiting the recycling market, but eventually have been sold for further trading for some conversion projects, etc. But we have seen also some 2000 semis, 2000 built and uh, post 2000 built uh, semis coming to the market. And last but not least, on the drilling rig side, we have the drill ships, uh, which in terms of LT are bigger. We have seen even up to 35,000 LDT uh, units uh, from 20 on average up to 35. Of course, we have worked on smaller units. These are very, very modern, and I mean, at least in the vast majority of them. Uh, some of them are, the majority are post-2000, some of them are even post-2010 built, neither South Korea, China, etc. Um, it's important Fendon, to note that... If I can ask you, where are these uh, units usually coming from? I mean, do you see them coming from which part of the world? Uh, is it usually in Singapore? Is it in the Americas? Uh, what's your experience telling you so far? From our experience, Vigeli, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very valid question because the majority of these units are being sold on as-is basis uh, because of the huge reactivation needed in order to bring them uh, to the recycling site. So we have identified that uh, they're coming from three major locations, one of them being obviously the U.S. Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, uh, where the majority of them have been laid up, uh, especially the semis. Uh, then, of course, you have here UAE, Sharjah, which is a very big uh, layup location for the jackups mainly. And uh, of course, you can see uh, Lab One, where you can see drill ships, you can see jackups as well, Malaysia total, Malaysia, Singapore range, let me put it that way, some semis as well. So you have seen uh, pretty much uh, the whole range there in Singapore and Malaysia. And does the delivery of the location that an owner is uh, choosing affect the, the, the value of the asset when you're making an offer? So for example, uh, an owner that is uh, thinking to sell his asset, is it going to get uh, the maximum value if he delivers in the Indian subcontinent, in uh, the Persian Gulf, in the Americas? Is it the same? Is it different? How does it affect the Definitely. Location? Take into account that the majority of the units will arrive under tow, especially with even the ones that can come under own power, for example, some semi-subs, or the drill ships uh, will have eventually to remove the thrusters for the beaching procedure. So this means that there will be an undertow vessel or units at some point in time. So obviously, uh, the further away from the recycling site these are being sold, uh, the more affected the price that the owner will get will eventually be. Um, Thank you, Feather. 
And what about the characteristics of each unit, like uh, the equipment that they have on board? I mean, we have the audience asking, for example, does the equipment affect uh, the value of the unit? Uh, or does the characteristics like uh, length and diameters and so on, uh, does this affect uh, when the residual value that you are taking into consideration? Uh, very valid question, Vangelis. Um, since we have touched upon this matter, I would like to also discuss how the recycling market is valuing these units in total. And of course, when I'm discussing about recycling market, we have to identify which are the major recycling markets for these units. And eventually these are India and Turkey. The reasons being, first of all, because they have the experience factor, the know-how, they have been doing this recycling uh, for several decades, I mean, of these specific rigs and units. Uh, the second factor being, of course, that uh, there is a very liquid secondary market for selling all this equipment, the drilling equipment, which I'm going to explain in a couple of seconds. And the third, of course, uh, is the green recycling factor, because in India and Turkey, to some extent in Bangladesh, but in Bangladesh right now you have only one yard, while in India and Turkey you have several yards. Uh, there is this green recycling service provided from the yards, meaning that the yards will have uh, the majority of yards in India and some of the yards in Turkey uh, valid the statement of compliance from a uh, NIAC classification society with regards to compliance with the practices of the Hong Kong Convention for the National uh, for Ship Recycling. Um, that taken into account, we'll, I would like to explain a few things about the plus and minus points, the pros and cons, as we like to say, on valuing these units. And obviously, uh, the extra drilling equipment on board these units is a very big plus. And when I'm talking about drilling equipment, I would like to refer to BOPs, top drives, cementing units, drill pipes. All these are high value items that obviously add to the price per long term that the owner will eventually receive for his vessel. But as always, there's another factor. The factor that uh, these are exactly high value equipment and owners, either these are third party items and have to be removed or the owners decide to remove all these items, exclude them from the sale to be more precise and place them on board other units that they have. So eventually the units arrive to the recycling site pretty much stripped. So instead of getting this premium over a normal bulk carrier tanker, they end up being sold at a discount. Fedon, thank you very much for this. Uh, while I do not mean to interrupt you, I think it's a good opportunity to ask Captain Yogis here because I think he might have a different uh, view on is this additional and valuable ex equipment always indeed valuable or sometimes it can be a liability, Captain? What do you think about this? And uh, we'll get back uh, to Fedon shortly thereafter. But... Uh, this, this is a double-edged question. It all depends on the market condition. If the market is good, uh, the breaker is likely to give uh, premium for that. If the market is not good, although it is not part of the lightweight, uh, they may not uh, put any value to it. Uh, they will play this game of let the owner remove it. And there is a cost associated with removal. And then the owner, asset owner has to decide whether they want to remove it or they want to let it go with the sale with the vessel. So, for example, I mean, uh, I think we have recently seen several units coming in with uh, thrusters being fitted, right? I mean, from an operational perspective, having thrusters there, I'm not sure if it's positive or negative, but I guess uh, if Ruben was to comment on this, probably he would tell us that this equipment would be valuable uh, a lot more than just scrap, right? So something that from one point of view is uh, having a extreme value in the secondhand market or while building this unit, can it be a liability when it comes to the recycling and how does this affect uh, the residual value? Is it positive, negative? I mean, we don't have to be specific, but just a general it, it is both. It's valuable as a product. It has a lot of non-ferrous items in it. So it has value from the recycling point of view, but it is negative because it increases the draft, increases the, uh, the drag of the uh, unit. It requires bigger tug, bigger cost so then the as ultimately it's the owner the asset owner gets less value uh, all right thank you captain uh Fedon, coming back to you uh, what other restrictions do you see there i mean when determining the value of the asset i mean physical restrictions play a role the breadth of the unit the length of the unit and so on when an owner is placing a unit in the market should he be thinking about this are you taking care of it definitely vageli thank you for the question once again uh, Coming to the cons of uh, these units when it comes to the recycling perspective, definitely the dimensions of the unit play a big role. Just uh, take the case of India, for example, several yards are 
probably 50, 60, 70 meter wide. And when you have, for example, a semi-submersible arriving with a beam of excess 100, then you will understand that definitely it's a very boutique market for this unit because maybe there are a couple, five yards that can take such a unit. Uh, so you, don't have, you cannot create such a competition between the yard players. Um, obviously, another restriction, as very correctly Captain Yogi has uh, stated, is a draft. Uh, for example, we have seen semi-subs uh, arriving with anywhere between 9 to 12 meter um, draft. We have seen jack-up rigs that may have a low pontoon draft, but definitely having spot cans protruding, adding to the draft, you may reach 7, 8 meters or even excess that. And uh, obviously the high draft will lead to a bad beaching. And when I'm talking about the bad beaching procedure, I mean that the unit will end up being beached far away from the yard. So the yard owner will need to incorporate cost and time for bringing the unit or cutting the unit, bring the material back to the yard, which obviously will bring the discount factor uh, to the owners. Thank you, Fedor. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, you were mentioning that you have prepared some data for us to have a look at, right? I mean, where the units are going at? Are they mostly being recycled in India? Which is the market which is absorbing most of this tonnage? Uh, do you have some information with regards to what India has done over the past few years when it comes to recycling offshore assets? Correct, Vigeli. Uh, as I mentioned already, we have seen that uh, the major uh, sites for uh, offshore drilling rigs would be India and Turkey. Um, and this is because mainly of the requirements of the owners. First requirement being obviously that the owners of offshore rigs are mainly either stock listed or state companies, which means that they will target, first of all, the safe and environmentally sound recycling, as I said, valid SOC uh, from an IX class, or some of the owners opt to bring their vessels to Turkey in compliance with the EU ship recycling regulation for EU approved yards. Parenthesis, as of today, there are less than 30 yards uh, EU approved all over the globe, but due to dimensions, due to capacity, uh, right now only the six ones in Turkey are the ones that are being targeted by the offshore owners. There are rumors that they will become nine by the end of the year, but for the time being, there are six. And of course, the second uh, factor... Feather, that's a good point you're raising, and sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting. Dr. Yeah. Anand, uh, have Indian recycling facilities applied so far to be part of the EU uh, recycling regulation and to be including in the list there? How can you update us on that? Uh, well, uh, 20 yards have applied for the EU list. And out of the 25 yards have been already audited by the auditors appointed by the EU, EU Commission. But so far, none of the yards have been approved. Uh, yards in, uh, in uh, India itself, right? So the exactly. outcome is still yeah. expected, but they have been audited so far. Yeah. All right, Fedon, please go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yes, uh, just to complete the requirements of the owners and why they are going to India and Turkey, also because of the transparency factor. These owners want to maintain a complete grip over the recycling process, which means that they are hiring third-party uh, services, to uh, third-party vendors to go on board and monitoring uh, the, and report back to them the recycling process. Of course, hearing the call of the owners, GMS has in-house already such a program, the GMS Responsible Ship Recycling Program, which Dr. Anand, I think, will cover later, uh, which obviously provides uh, such services. Now, going back to your question, Vigeli, about a uh, closer look to India. I would like to share my screen and uh, please confirm to me that everybody can see this. Vagelli? Yes, I don't, yes, I okay. can see your screen. Okay. So starting, I would like, a second. I would like to share this graph with you. Um, this graph actually tracks the offshore recycling uh, units in India from the period of 2010 to 2020. Uh, we are talking about the total offshore tonnage being recycled in India, meaning jack-up rigs, semis, drill ships, tugs, cable layers, FPSOs, everything. And we are talking about beached units. We're not talking about either negotiated units or units in the market. We're talking about units that have arrived in India and beached. You will see that the red line actually tracks the total LDT per year in metric tons. And you will see also that uh, the blue bars are actually representing the total number of units. So there are two takeaways, in my opinion, this graph. First of all, you can see that for a period of 2010 to 2015, where we had pretty much good oil prices, high oil prices, you can see that uh, the activity has been quite slow in the offshore recycling sector, in India at least. And then obviously with the 2015 oil crisis, you can see that both the total LDT and number of vessels has increased exponentially. Obviously 2020, and you'll keep hearing uh, me talking about this, is not a representative year because we had markets closed for one and a half months. Uh, we had problems with takeovers. 
etc. So it's not representative here. But we can see that the trend is to increase. The second thing I wanted to mention is about comparing 2018 to 2019, where you will see that in 2018 you have more vessels, more offshore units heading for recycling uh, in comparison to 2019. But on the contrary, you can see that the LDT has been higher in 2019. This obviously uh, leads us to the conclusion that in 2018 you had smaller offshore units such as tag supply vessels, etc., being recycled, while in 2019 you had bigger units, FPSOs, semis, etc. Moving forward, I would like to share this graph with you, which is a comparison uh, between the, other, the total LDT that has been recycled for the past uh, uh, five, six years, if you include 2020. Uh, this is presented in this ch uh, chart by the blue bars. And the green line here tracks actually the average WTA annual price in dollars per barrel. The important thing I would like everybody to note here is that from the period of 2016 up to probably 2019, we have experienced a higher average WTI, oil price in general. Uh, which, but in comparison to this, we can see that the recycling volumes have increased, have kept increasing to be actual. So this means that still at 40, 50, and 60 dollars per barrel, definitely offshore rig owners do not see any merit on utilizing and putting, reactivating their units and put them back into play. One thing that is not certain in this statistic is the fact that uh, if I had uh, extended the green line back to 2014, you would see that it's definitely not up to $50, but it's up to $90 average oil price for 2014. This is some food for thought for the correlation between oil prices and recycling volumes. Obviously, there is a big correlation between low oil prices and increased recycling volumes. Last but not least, on a closer look, uh, for the rigs, uh, the drilling rigs, jack-up rigs, drill ships, and semi-subs. We track here the five-year uh, trend. Again, I'm not counting 2020. It's not representative here. What I would like everybody to see in this, uh, uh, let's say, matrix is the fact that everybody keeps asking me, all the owners are asking me, what will be the next type that, uh, of offshore unit that will come for recycling? And in my opinion, the important is a jack-up rig. Because as you can see in 2015 and 2016, you had literally no activity in the recycling front for the jack-up rigs. And from 2017, you can see three units, seven units, nine units in 2019. And of course, in 2020, you have already only two units having been beached. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Vangelis, I believe there are around eight or ten units that have been jack-up rigs that have been either sold or currently being negotiated for recycling. And that's yes, also there are my quite side. a few in the market. You're right, Fedor. And I think also Ruben is going to be covering uh, on this uh, in a while into more detail and uh, provide us his view uh, about uh, the status of these assets uh, which are being laid up and so on. But it's a very valid point. But before we get there, I think it's uh, important to, before going to the recycling facility, to understand also the challenges in the transportation itself. So, um, Captain Yogas, uh, you've been in this industry for quite a while, as we presented already. What changes have you seen over the years when dealing with offshore assets? When was the first time when you started dealing with it uh, during these 20 years? What has been the progress throughout? And uh, is basically an offshore asset requires the same handling as what you're doing in a normal ship, like uh, when uh, you're taking over with your operations team and so on? What challenges do you face while handling these offshore assets? And are you satisfied with the outcome we are seeing so far in a corporate level? Do you think we are confident in doing every single type out there? Oh, thank you, Vagelis. Thank you for highlighting my age and wisdom, I guess. Uh, yes, I've been in this industry since 2001. And uh, I can definitely say with authority that offshore industry has changed remarkably as far as recycling is concerned. The first time GMS and myself, like we got involved in recycling of offshore unit was in 2005 when we did one semi sub from Brazil and towed it all the way to Singapore. In fact, uh, while on the way we got an opportunity and we took it to Singapore. Uh, and that was the first time a cash buyer had done an as is delivery. There were 
asset owners were delivering these units on their own to different locations, Turkey, uh, but that was the first time uh, Cash Bar had undertaken this task of moving an offshore unit which was laid up from Brazil to its destination. After we did it successfully, the next opportunity which came in was in the year 2010, 2011. So in those five years, there was no activity at all as far as cash buyers were concerned. And luckily, we did the same unit which we brought from Brazil to Singapore. We took it back from, Brazil, uh, from Singapore to the recycling yard. So you can see the gap of five years from no activity. And then remarkably in 2015, I got an opportunity to write an article for Marine Money uh, regarding recycling of offshore units. Uh, and the topic was pricing and the operational challenges. And the heading I gave to that article was putting a price tag on Haley's Comet. Uh, the, the sole reason was because it was once in a while activity and there was no last done pegging which we could do. Uh, and as compared to that, today itself, there are about 15 units in the market which are in various stages of being negotiated or just sold yesterday. So you can imagine from in 2005, one unit, 2010, one unit, and in 2020, we have, today we have 15 units in the market. Definitely there is a change. And on the other hand, in 2005, when we did this unit from Brazil, there was not even a single underwriter who was willing to underwrite that risk. And we had to hire marine warranty surveyors as our surveyors. They prepared this unit and we underwrote the risk ourselves. Compared to today's market where we have a unit, we will get at least two underwriters or maybe three underwriters willing to cover the risk. And this is a remarkable change in these years from 2001 to 2020. Thank now, you, Captain. So I think we can safely say that basically the industry has evolved itself throughout all these years, uh, together with uh, the experience and the expertise that we have also developed together with it. And I mean, as you are saying, from one unit back in 2005 and uh, sporadically units thereafter, I mean, nowadays we're having handling simultaneously, I don't know how many units on a weekly basis and taking over assets like this, at least uh, from our side here. Uh, would you like to add anything further on this or should I pass to Ruben to tell us his view? Yeah, the, uh, like the, you know, the handling of these units, uh, comparing it with the conventional tonnage like bulk carriers or tankers, uh, it is totally different. Uh, we are so used to dealing with normal bulk carriers and tankers. All you got to do is tell us it's a Panamax tank, a Panamax bulker. We know the specs, we know the behavior, we know the uh, how the unit will work. Uh, even, even if you're towing, we know uh, what would be the draft, how she will tow. Whereas if you compare it with offshore units, not even as, we have never seen a situation where two units, even though called sister ships, they would be exactly alike. They wouldn't behave similar way. Their lightweight probably would be different. Their looks would be different, but they would be called sister ships. So uh, handling them is totally different. And I can say, definitely say that no two units are alike. Uh, what worked on one unit may not work on the other. Techni uh, technically or for the towage, you know, how she will behave in the seaway. Uh, the wider panel of marine warranty surveys is allowed these days. Uh, but on offshore units, they will stick with very specific marine warranty surveyor. Uh, and, and of course, we have raised issues on that. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ruben is going to comment on that. 
Our choice is to have a wider panel, but uh, the underwriters stick to only one surveyor for, I'm pretty sure there is a reasoning behind it and I will watch for it. Uh, so, we are fortunate to have uh, to, to have him uh, amongst us here. So maybe he can tell us what's the secret of this success. Uh, what are the technical issues related uh, when preparing and uh, safely for the successful transportation, and uh, basically uh, ensuring the safe delivery to the recycling facility. Which, of course, I mean, apart from uh, an underwriter's uh, point of view that they want to be having safety issues there, of course, from a Offshore owners' perspective, it's important to ensure that the unit is being transported safely. So, Ruben, uh, coming to you, uh, what are the uh, steps you are undertaking uh, in order to ensure this safe transportation? What is the is the background of your clients helping you? Like, is it the same dealing with every cash buyer out there? Uh, is it important to have uh, good cooperation? Uh, through the office, on, on the spot, of course, on the asset itself, doing the transportation, and basically what are these steps taken in order to ensure the safe transportation of the asset? Sure. First of all, uh, Vagelis and GMS, thank you very much for inviting me today to share my uh, views on the whole topic. Um, as you may know, uh, my company, Aqualis, Bremer, and uh, myself have been involved in the offshore industry now for the past 20, 25 years. Uh, in operational assets, not just uh, for the recycling, but for the operations side, which I think is what has made us probably the industry leader uh, for taking these assets to the recycling yards as well. Uh, we've been with these assets from the day they've been built, and now we're seeing the same assets, even ones which I've been project manager of during construction, now going for recycling, which is uh, quite surprising. Uh, but if I could, if you, if I may. I'd just like to give you a little update on where we are and why we are here. I know Fadon discussed the situation with the number of assets coming and Captain Mohani also explained why there's been this long gap between five years and five years and where we are today. But if I may just share my screen with you, I will explain how we got there in the first place. Yes, please uh, give us an update on the current status of the market. So hopefully you can see this. Okay. Yep. Okay. If I can, uh, there we go. So the status as it stands today, uh, I've been presenting this at a few of the conferences over the years. Um, and as quite rightly Fadon mentioned, back in 2015, we had a major crisis in the oil price dropping from the, the 150s, 130s, way back down to the crash that we had, which was uh, unforeseen. As a consequence at the time, a lot of vessels went into, into warm layup, cold layup, idle. And unfortunately, even to this day, they have never come out of that situation. The, the market never recovered. Even though the oil price recovered to $40 and $50, it still did not recover in what we saw practically happening outside. One of the other problems that we have, these units are all built in the 70s and 80s. And once they get to that stage, to bring an asset out of cold stack can cost you sometimes in the region of 40 to $50 million. And it's just not worth it for a unit of this age. Over the last 18 months, we could say, there has been an improvement in the market. This shows you that there's been an improvement in the market in the utilization of the fleet. However, start of this year again, COVID has come into play and it has directly impacted what has happened into the market. COVID has had a direct uh, say in utilization, in the oil price. And what you're now seeing is some of the new units, as uh, mentioned earlier, 10-year-old units, also going for recycling. There's simply no business for them. Saying that, last year, there were 265 units available for recycling through cold and idle stacking. Here we now have 268, which seems to suggest there's been no change. There has been a change. There have been uh, way over 40 to 50 units between Turkey and India go to scrap. But in the last uh, 12 months in particular, and particularly the last six months, the number of uh, rigs gone back into warm layup has kind of counterbalanced what we've done over the last 12 months in terms of recycling. So we still have way in excess of 200 units available for recycling, which, which leads to show that we've still got a few years ahead of us yet. And this just gives you an idea, uh, Fadon mentioned 
jackups in particular. So as we are today, we have 163 jackups ready for recycling. These, I, I, these units will never come out of cold layup. There's a high chance that we will never see them again in operation. The problem that we have is that they're in unusual parts of the world. They're in Gulf of Mexico. They are in West Africa. They are in parts of Asia where it is not easy to tow them across to India or Turkey. So although there's a large number of units, will they ever go to Turkey or India? It's also quite difficult to predict right now. Same situation is with the floaters as well, which includes the semi-subs and the drill ships. As it stands today, we have over 80 units ready for in uh, cold stack. This, however, has come down over the previous years. Uh, and I suspect over the next 12 to 18 months, this will start to level itself out. And as Fadon mentioned earlier, it'll be the jackups where we really will put our focus in. So this just briefly shows you the status of the float market and the very high utilization that we had back in 2014 to where we are today, 2020. Huge decline in utilization and hence a huge increase in the number of rigs which are available in uh, cold layup and warm layup. And the same for the jackup market, except it's even more extreme. If you look at what is predicted for 2021, the world fleet of jackups will half in the terms of number of operational assets. So it's, uh, it's doom and gloom for the industry that we're involved in everyday operationally, but for the recycling industry, you can see there's gonna be a big change going forward. So that's a, just a very quick update on, on where we are as, um, as an industry, of which we play a large part of the operational side and of course, a large part of the recycling side as well. Thank you for this, Ruben. Uh, it was really interesting. And uh, so basically, I think you have given us a pretty accurate idea of what is the current status of the market and uh, what we should be expecting in the next uh, 12 months to come. Yes. Uh, when it comes to delivering of the units uh, between uh, the Indian subcontinent and the Mediterranean region, uh, where are mostly approved EU yards right now, like uh, uh, in Turkey and so on. Uh, what are your views um, on that topic? I mean, the transportation difficulties, the availability, the capacity, and so on. Yeah, I mean, putting the, the Hong Kong Convention, the EU Convention to one side for a moment. There, there are other issues as well. To get to India, we have, of course, monsoon season, which we've just passed by. We've got three months of, of quite severe weather where we just simply cannot tow these assets around. As Captain Rahani mentioned earlier, no two assets are the same. And I know David is going to talk about this in a few minutes. Towing these units is not like any conventional ship. You put on a towing bridle, Uh, I think we have a connection problem with Ruben. Are, uh, are the rest uh, online? Um, maybe I can pass the opportunity to, to David. Um, David, uh, while we're waiting for, uh, I think Ruben is back with us. Or not, uh, David. Well, let's go to what uh, Ruben was trying to say, probably, I guess, before uh, we lose that connection with him. Or, or Ruben, are you back? Are you online? I, I think you are muted. Small technical problem there. We'll try to overcome it. Yeah, I think you're with us. Yes, you're back. That's fine. So I think we lost the connection when you were trying to say about the towers okay. transportation. Yeah, so sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, yes, yeah, so the problem, one of the problems we have to go through these, these areas of, of quite severe weather with a jack-up rig or a semi-submersible, it's just not viable. To come from West Africa around the Cape, to go across the Atlantic, is, is not going to happen. We even have jack-ups today in Alaska, which is not going to happen. Uh, we've had jack-ups and semi-submersibles coming from Singapore, and people forget we had to close down Singapore Airport for, for uh, 10 minutes to cross by, uh, to go past the airport, which we would never do if we were towing a ship. So there's a lot of complications to tow these things around. Never mind the fact we have long legs. Never mind we have spud cans. Never mind the fact we have uh, very large tugs required sometimes. 7,000 ton light ship jackups being towed with 150 ton bollard pull tugs. Yeah, we can we can simply tow a 30,000 uh, light ship uh, bulk carrier 
for the 100 ton bollard all took. So there's a lot of complication and no two vessels, is exactly what Captain Mahoney said, no two vessels are the same. And, and the complications we have with the Mediterranean, the complications we have with the Indian Ocean, of course, the passage up to Alang and uh, the, the currents that we have up there with 100 meter wide vessels, they all have their own complexity. And, and that's what makes it a very interesting business. Maybe that's what makes us the, the market leader, being the warranty surveyors with the experience that we have. But no two vessels are the same, and they should not be underestimated. Thank you, Ruben. And uh, straight to the point, I guess, I mean, uh, the, the example of Alaska, I mean, I guess it's not uh, one that we see every day, but uh, it's really interesting exactly what you said. The market is finding ways to adapt itself. And even for these units, uh, apparently from what we see every day, there are solutions. Uh, you just need to have the appetite to do it. And, uh, you know, it's not always about... Uh, I guess about the profitability or not out of it, but for the passion in finding the right solutions and uh, working together. Uh, and talking about working together, do you think every party is capable of doing this? I mean, do you see difference? I mean, we have heard a lot of incidents in the past, uh, I mean, I don't want to say past few days, what we are reading on the news, but uh, generally, which, which might be totally unrelated issues, sure. but during your experience in the offshore transportation asset, have you seen unsuccessful stories and how can this be avoided? Yes. We have, unfortunately, there are on, on some unsuccessful stories. Uh, like I said, I think it's, it's people underestimating the asset. Uh, we've been towing rigs around. We tow it with, with a single tug and everything is okay. We tow a rig which looks very similar with a, sim with a single tug and it doesn't work. We've ended up towing it with two tugs. David will, will uh, tell you all about that. So, there have been some issues. It has developed and evolved. Situation has changed where some of these assets are being manned. We would never normally man a uh, bull carrier under tow. We do man every jackup under tow. We do have to have people on board semi-submersibles to actually operate these rigs to drop them during adverse weather. So it is very, very different. And I think not all cash buyers are able to do this. Uh, not all rig operators even at times can do this. Even the boat owners, not every boat owner, just because they have a 200 ton bollard pull tug, understand how to tow these vessels around the, around the globe. So having the right partners, having the right cash buyer, having the right shipyard, uh, listening to the warranty surveyors, listening to the experience that is around you is very, very important. And I don't think anybody should under underestimate the complexity of some of these jobs. Uh, and some of them that we've been involved in, even on the dry transportation, have been the biggest, widest, deepest, uh, biggest drafts, you'll never see these on, on traditional vessels. So right partner, right towing vessel, right marine warranty surveyor, right cash buyer, uh, right shipyard at the other end, all very, very important part of the chain of getting these assets from, say, Brazil to successfully beaching in Alang. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. Uh, while totally agree with you, I don't know if David uh, shares exactly your views on having month jackups there. Uh, David, how does this affect your operations there? I mean, uh, does it make a difference for you when doing a vessel having a month jackup versus a non-month asset generally? But what are the challenges you are facing? You have been in the stream for quite a while, as we said. You, we worked quite closely together, and uh, I think you have established your name in the industry. What is uh, your takeaway from uh, offshore assets overall and their safe transportation? Well, I, I totally agree with what Ruben has been saying, and in particular with jackups. From our point of view, we would rather tow an unmanned jackup. The main reason being that when it is manned, that um, they tend to lower the legs down, which you know affects the towing speed. But our point of view starts, our, our job starts from the very beginning when we hopefully select the right tug for the right job and um, get that approved by the warranty surveyor. After which then we need to go into all the details of the towing gear, what the rig has got, what we have got and what we need to purchase to connect up for a safe voyage. And, um, and then it's our job to tow it to the destination. And it depends on the weather. Usually we can't go anyway if the weather is bad because the marine warranty surveyor won't let you. But uh, once we get on a voyage, usually it's pretty 
steady progress until we get to Alang. And uh, when we get to Alang, of course, <clears throat> depending on the draft of the vessel, sometimes there's restrictions going up the, up the channel, up the Grant, I think it's the Grant Channel. And um, when we get up off the, off the Alang, off the beach, that's when it gets a bit more difficult. In the past, several years ago, we could go up there and before they had VTIS in India, we could drift up and down 20 miles or so with the very strong currents. And um, that was quite a safe way to do it. But now VTIS restricts us to a very small area. So you have to use a lot of power to hold, especially these semis and jackups in position. You have to use a lot of power and you, you're probably using more fuel doing that than when you are doing the actual towing. And then after that, of course, it's the beaching process, which in India is very well controlled. The uh, beaching masters are very experienced, they're very good. And uh, we've never had any incident up there at all. I know a lot of ship owners are very reluctant to do that. And uh, partly because they maybe don't have the experience or the, the captains on the boats don't have the experience and they get nervous when they get anywhere close to land. But from our experience, we have not had any problem in India whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, interesting point that uh, in terms of uh, the authorities locally, I mean, do they usually assist you. The beaching pilots uh, seem to be guiding a safe and uh, sound process to be followed there. I think uh, you have answered the question, but uh, have you had any bad experience? Uh, uh, no, any we haven't had comment? Yeah. No, we haven't had any bad experience. Um, usually we, we, we go up there and the authorities come out now very quickly and do the clearance on the tug and do the clear, you know, on the, on the towed vessel or rig or whatever it is. And then we just have to wait until we're allowed to do the beaching. That can be a bit frustrating sometimes because I know you're negotiating LCs and things like that, which sometimes causes a delay. And that is the most critical time for us holding position off a lang in those extremely strong currents, if something should happen, say, to one of the engines of the tug or something like that. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, so having followed this process, uh, with your assistance, we have arrived at the ship recycling facility, right? So I guess uh, now the right person uh, to uh, come to is Dr. Anand. Uh, Anand, uh, we have some question actually from the audience here and I, would, I think it's a good opportunity to pass to you. So uh, they're asking about health, safety and the environmental monitoring processes and basically uh, how is this being monitored properly uh, on the recycling field? Uh, would you like to start with that and, and then you can tell us your experience on the field, what steps are being taken to ensure a safe and sound recycling process with proper monitoring? Well, thank you, Magalis, for the question. Uh, in fact, my journey with the offshore units mainly started from 2015. And uh, I'm really proud to say that, you know, in 20, in today I completed 18 ships, uh, 18 offshore vessels, uh, including semi-subs, jackups, and uh, uh, drill ships, and, and, uh, and including the floating, uh, floating support vessels and all. Uh, so it's a really a challenging job to maintain the health, safety, and environment at the ship recycling yard, uh, especially for the offshores. And uh, we have do, did a lot of trial and error methods to, to set up a very well standard now for the health and safety. To start with, when, the, when these offshore units come after breaching, we do a special risk specific risk assessment. With this, we come to know the loopholes, the areas where we need to consider, to, to consider mainly uh, if I say the working at height situations, the working in the confined space, uh, uh, safe for working conditions, cold work permits, hot work permits, emergency preparedness and response plan, because this is a crucial uh, thing for us because 
as a, uh, you know, uh, Fidon was telling, you know, it's sometimes these uh, offshore units are a bit far from the yard. Uh, at that place, we get a really uh, less time because the time between high tide and low tide at, at 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet away from the yard is very less. And uh, we need to have a very perfect emergency preparedness and response plan. Uh, these all things we do take care and we do have a special things for us because we have come up, come up with a lot of experience in, in handling these things, especially emergency cases and all. And uh, having an advanced firefighting system on board is quite important for such units, mainly when the work, work is going on at turret and uh, a direct part of the vessel. So uh, I say the health and safety is a continuous process. And uh, we, we, in the last five years, we have learned a lot and uh, there's a lot of things still we have to learn. And I, but I'm proud to say that, you know, we have recycled these 18 ships till date with, without a fatal accident uh, in our program. That's great. Uh, the program, yeah, you mean the GMS Responsible Ship Recycling Program, right? I mean, I guess there are uh, quite a few more. We're not talking about offshore units uh, because we said it's probably excess 60 units overall. Uh, but in these 18 units from the offshore, I mean, uh, the monitoring process that you have seen, I guess you have worked closely with third parties, right? Uh, when an owner is choosing uh, to select a third party. In several cases, they have appointed uh, you as the third party monitoring and reporting directly to owner through our GMS Responsible Ship Recycling Program. Uh, how this cooperation is usually working from you with the recycling facilities? Do they meet their uh, requirements uh, that um, an owner from the offshore industry is coming to? Uh, and uh, how is uh, the development of the recycling facilities in your opinion over the past few years? Well, uh, as you may be aware, you know, to, at, as on today, we have 86 ship recycling yards, which are compliant with the Hong Kong Convention. And, and uh, in the last five years, there's a huge improvement. As well as uh, upgrading the health, safety and environment of the workers. Uh, I feel, you know, the yard owners have uh, developed a lot and uh, there's, there is no problem in working with them because they do understand the requirement uh, from the sellers because most of the offshore unit owners like to come at the ground to have a look. They pre-audit the yards and their, their requirements are well set in, in the MOA. So it's, it's very easy for us now to handle with the workers because of the huge development which has taken place at the ground. All right, thank you, Anand. And uh, last but not least, uh, you might want uh, to answer another one of the questions I see is, uh, how long does it need, uh, generally take for, uh, recycling, for recycling an offshore asset? I mean, is it faster? Is it the same with a container, let's say, with a bulk carrier? What average span of life would you give? Well, it depends on uh, offshore to offshore unit. If you're talking about a drill ship, which is a shape of a ship, it, it's quite easy to beach it. So if, if I consider a drill ship with a container ship, it might take, uh, of the similar size, it might take three months more for the drill ship. Mainly I need to take out the equipment uh, from the deck of the drill ship and to take out the helipads and all. And in considering the health safety aspects, it takes a bit more time for the drill ship compared to a container. But if you talk about the semi-sinable, uh, semi uh, semi the beaching of these units usually take a bit uh, away from the yards and it takes usually one more month or so for the ship, ship recycling yards to pull these vessels near to the yard. And due to the co complexity involved with these structures, and uh, I can tell you that, you know, I have recycled, um, monitored a vessel where I ended up pro pro providing 19 monthly recycling reports to the seller. So it took it one and a half year for me to recycle, to, to, to complete that vessel. So it depends on uh, vessel to vessel, but, uh, but there should not be a time restriction for such vessels to recycle, in my opinion, because uh, these are complex structures and these, these time, vessels need time to recycle in a safer manner. Yeah, I think the takeaway basically from all of us, I mean, I think is uh, that safety is of paramount importance. I think uh, both David and Ruber highlighting it, uh, Captain Yogyas and Dr. Anand as well. Uh, Fedon, one question I have from the audience coming up, uh, and I think it might be best for you to address it. Uh, they're saying, are offshore assets uh, owners more or less prepared to pay for green recycling? Uh, or uh, they are prefer, I guess they mean, or they prefer to go for the top dollar. I mean, 
I guess you can address our experience in both the shipping sector and the offshore sector and uh, hear your views on that. Correct. Thank you, Vangeli, once again. Um, I believe that uh, this comes uh, down to what I have already suggested, that talking about the offshore sector, uh, we know that the drilling rig uh, owners will primarily be uh, state-owned companies and also stock-listed companies. And obviously, the shareholders of these companies will obviously act and uh, press upon the fact that we need to have HKC recycling, green recycling overall. To that extent, yes, indeed, they are ready to pay the price for this. And especially when you see, let's say, post-2010 uh, build drill ships uh, that may have a new building price. Well, Ruben may be um, more, uh, can elaborate more on this, but may have a new building price of maybe 400 to 500 million being sold at the recycling prices of 10, 11, 9 million. You understand the price gap there. And definitely, they are ready to pay this price. And uh, of course, GMS is there to assist them. And obviously, there are, some of them are ready even to pay the price difference between HKC recycling versus EU approved yard recycling. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult, as everybody has adjusted already, and especially Captain Yogi, that it's very difficult to put a price tag on such units. It's uh, by all means, you can see that there is a Baltic demolition assessment for tankers, uh, bulkers, but there is nothing such thing such for uh, offshore units. So to that uh, extent, you cannot really put the price tag unless you have seen and inspected the unit. But on average, I would say that if you go for HKC, let's say, let's say Turkey, because you have both options there, HKC and EU approved yards, then depending on the capacity available, if the yards, the six yards that are going for, uh, that are already EU approved, have the capacity to take this unit, you can face a discount of probably 70 up to $100 per metric ton. Thank you, Fedon. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, before I go on with the questions, I would just like to remind everyone that uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and you will be able to download it uh, through the GMS application. You can simply download it uh, to your mobile phone and have a quick and easy access to it uh, through there. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, before our time is over, basically I'd like to go on with a couple of more questions and the remaining ones that might be left unanswered will try to have uh, an individual responding to each one uh, of those. Uh, another one is coming, is basically asking, is, is GMS keeping ITM report on each vessel? Uh, Dr. Anand, I think you have covered uh, this question already by explaining the GMS responsible uh, program, responsible ship recycling program, but uh, how, can you uh, elaborate this question again? I mean, um, how is it, uh, yes. can, you can explain maybe yes. how an ITM is prepared and so on. Uh, well, uh, we do prepare uh, for for the offshore owners when before they come before they are beached or in some cases due to the complexity involved, we do uh, do that uh, IHM even after beaching of the vessel because we do get a sufficient time before we get a cutting permission. So uh, the answer is yes because without the uh, IHM there is no green recycling, there is no safe and environment friendly recycling. So IHM is the heart of uh, the ship, the green recycling. So we do that first. And uh, as Abagali initially told that we already uh, have an experience of uh, doing an IHM for over 40 vessels. All right, uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, with this, I think our session is coming to an end. We have also reached uh, uh, our time limit. So I would like to take the opportunity and thank all the panelists and unless uh, somebody has something else to add here uh, no i think so thank you very much all thank you for attending this uh, gms webinar series as mentioned it will be available also to download in your uh, gms application uh, thank you each and every one of the panelists again for the great support and for taking the time in organizing this all thank right, you thank you thank you, thank you.